So in this video, we're going to see how we can use molecular orbitals to build up the structure and bonding in organic molecules. It follows on from two previous videos on atomic orbitals and hybridization and forming molecular orbitals. And again, it's relevant for our first year organic chemistry module. So in the first video, I told you that for any orbital mixing process, number of orbitals that goes into the process has to equal the number of orbitals out. And then in the second video, we did things like this, where we were mixing two orbitals in, uh, two atomic orbitals together, and we were producing one molecular orbital out. So clearly something wasn't quite right here. Um, well, actually, we, we covered a number of options where you could mix atomic orbitals together, and those are forming sigma bonding orbitals, sigma star antibonding orbitals, or pi bonding orbitals, or pi star antibonding orbitals. So the way that we fix our little tenet up here is that we have to mix everything both in phase and out of phase. So you can see I'm changing the phase of this s orbital over here. So this is the orbital you would get from in phase mixing or constructive overlap. Um, but the orbital you would get from out of phase mixing or destructive overlap is your corresponding antibonding orbital. So in order to make the, uh, the equation balance, if you like, whenever we mix two atomic orbitals together, we have to mix them both in phase to give us a bonding orbital and out of phase to give us an antibonding orbital. So we're going to look at some molecular orbital diagrams and we're going to start with something very simple and that's dihydrogen. So hydrogen is very simple, it's only got a 1s orbital so it, it makes things a bit clearer and a bit easier to understand. So if we've got two hydrogen atoms here, I've just labelled them HA and HB, obviously they're basically the same, they're equivalent, I've just colour coordinated them so you can see what's going on. So on hydrogen A we have a 1s uh, atomic orbital and that's filled with one electron because hydrogen has one electron. And on hydrogen B we have exactly the same, a 1s orbital which brings with it one electron. Uh, if you've not seen this uh, kind of nomenclature before then these arrows, these single headed arrows here represent a single electron. So what we're going to do in our molecular orbital diagram is uh, mix these orbitals together so these lines here, these levels, represent the energy level of the orbital that we're talking about. And we're going to see what happens to the energy as we start to mix things together. So if we mix our two 1s orbitals together constructively, we end up with a sigma bonding orbital. Now note that this is lower in energy than either of the orbitals that went into making it, because it's a, a beneficial thing to do. Um, and we said that there's this constructive overlap, so you end up with the uh, orbital uh, density in between the two atoms and filling this with electrons is a beneficial thing to have. So if we reverse the phase of one of our orbitals, I've picked hydrogen A arbitrarily, it could have been hydrogen B, but if we now mix out of phase then the resulting sigma star antibonding orbital that we're forming is higher in energy than either of the two orbitals that went into making it. So we're taking our atomic orbitals from this atom and our atomic orbitals from this atom and we're forming molecular orbitals in the middle of this diagram, one of which is low in energy, one of which is high. Now if you count them up, we've put two atomic orbitals in, one, two, and we've got two molecular orbitals out, one, two. So what we need to do now is, as our orbitals have mixed together, these atomic orbitals are going to disappear because they've been used to make the molecular orbitals. So the electrons have got to go somewhere. So we follow the Aufbau principle and we fill basically from the bottom to the top of our new molecular orbitals that we've formed. So if we take this electron and we push it into the lowest energy orbital it can go in, and we take this electron and we push it again into the lowest energy orbital it can go into. Now remember, each orbital can hold two electrons, so this is fine. And we commonly draw it like this um, to say that their spins are uh, paired. So if we get rid of our atomic orbitals, this is now our molecular orbital diagram for dihydrogen. We can see we've got a sigma bonding orbital which is filled, and a sigma star antibonding anti orbital which is empty. So our sigma bonding orbital between the two atoms has got a pair of electrons in it, and our antibonding orbital, which is outside of the internuclear distance, uh, is empty. So you can do a little bit of arithmetic here. So for, for every antibonding orbital you've got, which is filled, it will cancel out the corresponding bonding orbital. So we've got one filled sigma bonding orbital. We don't have any filled sigma star antibonding orbitals. So therefore, there is one sigma bond between these atoms. If we pushed a pair of electrons in and filled this sigma star antibonding orbital, it would cancel this bond out 
and this bond between the two hydrogens would break. But as it is, if we get rid of all of our orbitals, this is how we would draw it on a skeletal structure, just as a single bond between the two hydrogens. So now what we're going to do is look at a slightly more complicated example, a more relevant example for organic chemistry. And we're going to look at uh, the MO diagram of carbon. And we're going to go through the three different hybridization states of carbon. So starting with sp3 hybridization, we're going to use ethane as an example here. So I'm just going to highlight the two carbon atoms in ethane with yellow dots um, because I'm going to extrapolate them out here. And I'll, I'll give you visual representations of all the orbitals as they, as they form. I've labelled them carbon A and carbon B, but obviously they're equivalent. There's no difference between the two. Now, I've mentioned before, both of the carbon atoms in ethane are sp3 hybridized. And in the previous videos, we saw um, how we formed those, those orbitals and what they looked like on a molecular orbital diagram. So obviously, all of the uh, sp3 hybridized orbitals are pointing at the um, positions in a tetrahedron. And all of the orbitals are degenerate, so they're all equivalent in energy. And we, we showed how we formed this in a previous video. So the same is true of carbon B over here. Um, so we've got exactly the same on both of the carbons. Now, carbon has four valence electrons, so both of them come equipped with four electrons. Now, in ethane, um, three of these orbitals in, in carbon are forming bonds to hydrogen. So that's an entirely new MO diagram in every case, and we don't want this one to get too complicated. We're just going to focus on the bonding between these two carbons. So. All of these hydrogen atoms and their relevant 1s orbitals and all of the interactions that are going on there, uh, I'm basically going to kind of blank out. So all of these three orbitals and these three electrons are forming the three sigma bonds to the three hydrogens over here. So we're just going to kind of blank that out and we're going to focus on what's left, which is what's going to cause the interaction between the two carbon atoms. So same is true on carbon B. Now, if we look at the orbitals we've got left, we've got an sp3 orbital over here and an sp3 orbital over here. Now, if we look at directionality, they're pointing directly at one another. So we're dealing now in sigma rather than pi orbitals. So if we mix them in phase, we get a sigma bonding orbital, which looks like this. And if we mix them out of phase, we get a sigma star antibonding orbital. Again, the energy decreases or increases uh, depending on whether it's constructive or destructive overlap. And as these atomic orbitals start to disappear, the electrons need to go somewhere. So we fill from the bottom to the top. And our two electrons, which are left over on these carbons, go into our sigma bonding orbital. So we have a filled sigma bonding orbital and an empty sigma star antibonding orbital between these two carbons. So if we were to look, this on, look at this on a, a 3D kind of structure of, of ethane, if you like, then uh, ignoring all of the, the, the orbitals that are between carbon and hydrogen, then between the two carbons, we have a filled sigma bonding orbital, which is the one that's holding the two together. And then we have this empty sigma star antibonding orbital, which is outside of the internuclear distance. Um, and we'll see why those are important in later videos. So if we move on to ethene, so again, I'm just going to label the carbon atoms here. Ethene is sp2 hybridized. So our sp2 orbitals, again, which are degenerate, they all have the same energy, point at the, uh, uh, the, the, the directions of a trigonal planar geometry. And we then have that unhybridized p orbital, which is at 90 degrees to the plane. And the same is true on carbon B. And we saw why in the, in the video on hybridization, um, our p orbital is slightly higher in energy than all of these hybridized orbitals. So Carbon, again, is bringing four electrons to the party. Same is true on both sides. And uh, in ethene, we've now got two CH bonds. So once again, we're going to ignore these two orbitals and the two electrons here because they're forming sigma bonds to these two hydrogens. So we don't want things to get overly complicated. So now we've got these orbitals left over, one sp2 and one p orbital, which can interact. So same as we did before, right? our sp2 orbitals are pointing directly at each other. So if we mix them constructively in phase, we get a sigma bonding orbital and destructively gives us a sigma star antibonding orbital. Now, if we look at our p orbitals, they are not pointing at each other. They are parallel, but they are orthogonal to the internuclear distance. So this is not going to be end on sigma overlap. This is going to be side on pi overlap. So if we interact these Constructively, we end up with a pi bonding orbital, and destructively, the pi star antibonding orbital. 
Now you may notice that when we um, interacted in a sigma way, so sigma bonding or sigma star antibonding, the energy difference is quite large. So you get a big energy gain from forming a sigma bonding orbital and a big energy loss, if you like, or a detriment from forming a sigma star antibonding orbital. Um, whereas the pi interactions, you can see the energy change isn't as much. And that's just to do with the efficiency of overlap. So these two orbitals are pointing directly at each other, so they overlap very well. Whereas if you imagine the pi orbitals, uh, sorry, the p orbitals trying to overlap with each other, they've kind of got to reach across. So the orbital overlap isn't as efficient, so any energy gains you get aren't as, uh, aren't as large, and also energy, any energy detriment you get from forming antibonding orbitals also isn't as large, just because the orbital overlap isn't as efficient. So we do the same thing as we did previously, right? These orbitals are going to disappear, so the electrons have got to go somewhere, and we've got two electrons on each carbon um, to form the bonds between these two carbon atoms. So again, fill from the bottom to the top. So our sigma bonding orbital gets filled, and the next highest energy orbital is the pi bonding orbital. So our four electrons go in like this. So that once we've got rid of all our atomic orbitals, we now have a filled pi bonding orbital, which is, sorry, filled sigma bonding orbital, which is giving us a sigma bond between these two carbons. We have a filled pi bonding orbital, which is giving us a pi bond between these two carbons. And both of our antibonding orbitals are empty. So if we look at this on our three-dimensional structure again, sigma uh, orbital between the two carbon atoms is filled, that's the sigma bond, the single bond if you like, and our sigma star antibonding orbital is empty, and then kind of Above and below the internuclear distance, if you like, we have our pi orbital. Remember, this is two lobes of the same orbital. This isn't two pi orbitals. Uh, that's filled. That's giving us our double bond, if you like, our additional bond. And then our pi star antibonding orbitals, which are empty, uh, are just sticking out uh, away from the internuclear distance again. So finally, um, sp hybridization. So once again, highlighting the carbon atoms. So in sp hybridization, we have two sp hybridized um, atomic orbitals, which are pointing at 180 degrees to each other. And we have two unhybridized p orbitals, one of which is at 90 degrees to the sp hybridized orbitals. And the other one is mutually orthogonal to both. So they, they're basically all at 90 degrees to each other. So the same is true on carbon B over here. Now, carbon still got four electrons. So we can fill the lowest energy atomic orbitals with those. And now we're using one orbital and one electron to form a sigma bond to the hydrogen on each side. So this electron needs to come with us, but that's, this entire orbital is disappearing. So bear with it for the time being. Uh, it'll all make sense at the end. So again, we're going to grey those out. So now if we mix our sp orbitals in phase, this is sigma bonding because they're pointing directly at each other and sigma star antibonding for the destructive overlap. And we've got two p orbitals now. So we can mix them in phase to form two pi bonding orbitals, which are in, again, uh, mutually orthogonal planes. And two pi star antibonding orbitals, uh, again, in, this, in the equivalent planes. So if we get rid of our orbitals and fill up with electrons from bottom to top, we've now got a filled sigma bonding orbital and two filled pi bonding orbitals. So we've got two pi bonds and one sigma bond between these two carbons, which is what gives us the triple bond of acetylene. So on our three dimensional diagram, we've got a sigma bond, which is the single bond, if you like, and the antibonding orbital corresponding, which is empty. And then we've got a filled pi orbital and a pi star antibonding orbital in one plane and another filled pi orbital and the pi star antibonding orbital in the other plane. So as a final example, we've basically just been dealing with um, bonding and antibonding orbitals so far, but there's another important class of orbital you should know about. So let's look at methanol, uh, or formaldehyde if you like. So similar to how uh, ethene works, only now we're swapping one of the carbons for oxygen. So we've got a carbon over here and our oxygen over here. They are both sp2 hybridized, so the orbitals look very similar. Three sp2 orbitals that are slightly lower in energy and the unhybridized p orbital above. Now, you'll notice that the uh, orbital 
orbitals for oxygen are lower in energy than those for carbon, and that's to do with the difference in electronegativity between the two elements, but more on that in a later video. So we've now got four electrons on carbon, as we had before, but oxygen's a different element, so it brings more electrons with it. So oxygen's got six electrons. So once again, we've got two CH bonds on the carbon, so we're going to ignore these two orbitals and these two electrons, and we're going to grey those out. Uh, oxygen's not forming any more bonds, it's only forming bonds to carbon, so we can deal with all of this together. So once again, we're going to mix our sp2 orbital on oxygen with our sp2 orbital on carbon. They're pointing directly at each other, so this is sigma, so sigma bonding for a constructive, sigma star antibonding for destructive. And we've then got our p orbitals up here, which are parallel, but at 90 degrees. So we get a pi bonding interaction and a pi star antibonding interaction. Now you'll notice that the orbitals are leaning in one direction or the other now, they're not symmetrical, and we'll cover this in a later video. So here we've only been able to interact these two orbitals which are pointing at each other, and these two orbitals which are parallel to each other um, to form sigma and pi interactions. We've then got these two orbitals here that are left over. So if we start to fill with electrons, because these orbitals are going to disappear now, it's a grayed out, so we fill from the bottom to the top as we did before, and eventually when we get rid of all of our atomic orbitals, we've got a single sigma bond and a single pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen, which explains why it's double bonded. We've got a sigma bond and a pi bond between these two atoms. But what about these two orbitals over here, which haven't been used? So these are sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals on oxygen, and you can see they're filled with pairs of electrons. Well, if we bring these into the stack, um, these, are, these are molecular orbitals, if you like, but they're not shared with carbon. So carbon's had nothing to do with these. These, these molecular orbitals have, have just stayed on oxygen. So you can think of them as just being sp2 hybridized atomic orbitals. They haven't undergone any kind of mixing. So what these are, are non-bonding orbitals, right? They're not bonding, they're not anti-bonding, they've taken no part in the interaction between carbon and oxygen. And they're filled, and what we commonly uh, refer to these as is lone pairs. So if you've seen lone pairs drawn on a structure like this, that's basically what they are, is they are non-bonding orbitals that haven't been involved in any kind of interaction with the other atoms, um, and in this case, because they're filled, they're non-bonding lone pairs of electrons. So on our three-dimensional diagram, we've got our sigma orbital in between the carbon and the oxygen, that's our single bond if you like, sigma star antibonding orbital which is empty, filled pi bonding orbital, empty pi star antibonding orbital, and then our two filled non-bonding orbitals on oxygen uh, which are our lone pairs.